Richard Feynman, in the 1980s, published a seminal paper titled Simulating Physics with Computers, arguing that nature cannot be efficiently simulated by classical methods. In the same paper, he argued for quantum computing machines to simulate the quantum nature efficiently. Today, quantum computing is one of the hottest topics in future technology. Yet a lot of videos have popped up claiming that quantum computing is just a big hype. Basically useless for any real applications. If someone wants to make a fully functioning quantum computer tomorrow, then at least at the moment, we wouldn't have all that much we could do with it. That's a bold claim. And since some of these voices are former scientists, it's worth taking seriously. In this video, I'll give you an honest look at where quantum computing really stands and let you decide for yourself. Quick note before we start. Michio Kaku tends to overhype quantum computing. He's a string theorist, not a computer scientist, so we'll leave his takes out. Let us quickly go through some basics or motivation behind quantum computing. Quantum computation is a hybrid of computer science and physics, and it's rare to find someone equally fluent in both. You might know that, in principle, a computer can be built out of almost anything. Marbles, water pipes, or even dominoes, as long as it satisfies the Turing criteria. In the same spirit, quantum computation is about using the laws of quantum mechanics to construct a new kind of computing machine. So, what features of quantum mechanics are used? It is not entanglement. Instead, one exploits the inherent probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics itself. Even our day-to-day -day classical algorithms, from YouTube's recommendation system to Google's PageRank, make use of probabilistic reasoning. However, the probability in quantum mechanics is slightly different, or let's say more general than the usual probability law. This new probability law of quantum mechanics is then exploited by a quantum computer. In quantum mechanics, the probability can be negative or even complex numbers. This is visible in the quantum interference effect, the phenomenon behind the bright and dark fringes of the double slit experiment. These interference patterns reveal how quantum probabilities behave differently from classical ones. It's an essential feature of quantum mechanics. So when we speak of probability, we mean something different in the context of quantum mechanics than we do when we talk about probability in everyday life. Usually we talk about probability like the probability that it's gonna to rain tomorrow in the sense that we're ignorant of some of the features of the system that we're trying to predict. Quantum mechanics is different because there is intrinsic randomness. Even if you have a complete description of a physical system, you can't predict what you're going to see when you observe the system. That's really something new in physics. And it's kind of crazy, right? I mean, this is one of the issues, not the only one by any means, that Einstein had. You know, he, I think, went to his grave imagining that maybe the probabilities in quantum physics were like those in weather reports, and we just didn't know the deepest description of reality, and that one day when we did, we'd realize that those probabilities were just an emergent feature of not having the full description. I mean, is that an accurate description of his thinking? Richard Feynman, in the 1980s, emphasized this point in his seminal paper simulating physics with computers, arguing that nature cannot be efficiently simulated by classical means. In the same paper, he argued for quantum computing machines to simulate the quantum nature efficiently. A few years later, David Deutsch turned that idea into reality by proposing the first concrete quantum algorithm in the 1980s. While it is clear that quantum computers might be useful for simulating quantum mechanics, there's no reason why they should be useful for our day-to-day -day applications. But in the 1990s, Shaw showed that quantum computers can factor large numbers efficiently. This means one could break RSA encryption, the backbone of our digital security. Around the same time, Grover's algorithm offered a quantum speed up for searching through data. This has a huge practical application. 3Blue1Brown has a very nice video about this. Together, this proved that quantum computers can truly outperform classical ones for some special problems that can be useful in our daily life. If quantum computing is so useful, then what's the issue? After decades of research, the reality is more sobering. 30 years later, we still point to those same two examples whenever we talk about the power of quantum computing. 
Even worse, Grover is an abstract oracle-based algorithm, not useful practically. Yes, hardware has improved enormously. We now have thousands of qubits, advanced error correction protocols, and increasingly stable quantum chips. But even if quantum computers became fully functional tomorrow, we wouldn't have many real-world applications. This brings us to a deeper question. Is there truly a quantum advantage, or is it forever big hype? Companies like Google and IBM have announced that they've reached quantum supremacy, but only for problems specifically engineered to be easy for quantum systems and useless for anything else. These experiments prove technical capability, not practical relevance. It is like solving problems for the sake of solving problems. However, it might also be the case that we are hunting a much bigger fish. For me, proving quantum advantage seems more like a physics problem, similar to how thermodynamics gave statistical mechanics. As discussed earlier, the real secret source behind quantum power seems to be quantum interference. The ability of quantum amplitudes to cancel or reinforce each other, amplifying the correct answer while suppressing the wrong ones. Then, we can formulate this problem like a computer scientist. Problems solvable by quantum computers efficiently are BQP with a classical counterpart called BPP. The grand challenge of quantum complexity theory is to prove that BQP is strictly larger than BPP, that quantum computers can truly do more than any classical one. But that's extremely difficult because there might always exist a clever classical algorithm that we haven't discovered yet. 25 years uh, has been about the capabilities and limitations of quantum computers. And um, um, a, a quantum computer would you know, exploit quantum physics to, we hope, solve a, a slightly larger class of problems in polynomial time than just P, okay? Uh, so, uh, uh, so we now uh, get to exploit nature in a new way uh, to do computation, and uh, it gives us a new class of efficiently solvable problems, uh, which is called BQP, uh, which stands for Bounded Error Quantum Polynomial Time, okay? And so, so uh, uh, BQP, uh, which is you know the, the class of problems efficiently solvable by a quantum computer, uh, contains P, right? So you know it, it, anything you do with a classical computer, you can also do with a quantum computer, uh, and and of course you know. Uh, and that's the heart of the problem. It's not enough to build a quantum solution. You must prove that no classical method can ever match it. Until that's shown, either theoretically or through undeniable experimental advantage, quantum computing will remain a technological marvel searching for its applications. Now, let's zoom out. How can humanity actually make the next big technological breakthrough? There are three ways. First, through pure math and logic. That's where AI and software come from. Second, by exploring physics on the large scale. And third, by digging into the small scale. Each scale of nature reveals a new layer of reality. And to push technology forward, we have to master that layer. That's why quantum computing matters. It's the frontier of physics at the smallest scales we've ever explored. And fittingly, this year's Nobel Prize in Physics went to the pioneers of superconducting qubits, one of the leading platforms for quantum computers.